Hey, this is Benji from Grow and Convert. I wanted to take a moment and introduce our next guest, Bernard of ClearScope. I got introduced to Bernard about two years ago when we were making the transition from a content marketing agency that didn't have much of an SEO focus to one that does have more of an SEO focus. And when I did a demo of his product and heard about the way that he thinks about producing content and approaching SEO, a lot of things stood out to me because he approaches SEO in a very different way than most people. Uh, over the last two years, we created our process called Pain Point SEO. And in this interview, you'll kind of understand why Pain Point SEO makes a ton of sense for where SEO is headed. In this interview, we get into a, a lengthy discussion with case studies about how to get, how to identify what to write for a keyword that you're going after. And Bernard shares his formula and his thoughts about what's changing in SEO and where SEO may be headed in the future. This was a really fascinating discussion for Davis and I, and I really hope you enjoy this one. If you do enjoy this, please subscribe to our channel. We're gonna to try to release more of these interviews going forward, and please leave a comment in the comment section. Enjoy. Super excited to have you here, Bernard. Um, do you wanna give a quick background on yourself and your company? Yes, absolutely. No, thanks for having me. So, Long story, very short. Let's start with, I guess, the most relevant stuff. I'm one of the co-founders at ClearScope, which is a software as a service to help people improve their overall content quality. I launched that four years ago and so far, so good. Before that was doing a lot of SEO consulting in the Bay Area for notable companies like DoorDash, Teespring, it's kind of where we learned the ins and the outs and the arounds of SEO in a very holistic way. And then before that, I was head of growth at some Y Combinator startup called 42 Floors, which was like Zillow, except for office space. That's where I dipped my toes into SEO because that was one of the, the channels that we were doing um, and it worked out very well. So brief bit of say, background. Did you just say Zillow was kind of like office space? No, no, no. 42 floors was like Zillow, except for office space. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I thought you were comparing Zillow to the office space movie. That would have been hilarious. <laughs> um, I, 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 wanted, I, was, I wanted to start the conversation talking about like ranking factors, but you said something that I want to do first because the ranking factors will just launch us into this entire discussion of like SEO nerd dumb. Um, yeah. You said you guys were doing SEO consulting in the yeah. Bay Area before ClearScope. I didn't know that. Um, is there, I, I don't know if you've told the story before, I have not heard it, but what was, was there, is there any interesting parts of like the insights to the story where you were like, hold up, we could build software. Like, did you get this? And, and you can explain, cause I'm not sure everyone who's gonna watch this knows sort of the backstory of ClearScope. Um, I can also give my two second understanding of it. Um, but was there a point where you were like, do maybe doing what ClearScope does now and in, in kind of a manual way and then and then realize it could be automated. I'm curious about that. Absolutely. So when you do SEO consulting, the thing that at least we got to learn very quickly was this overarching concept of search queries deserve different stuff, right? When you're doing SEO consulting, say for DoorDash, then when somebody lands on a page for San Francisco food delivery, what they want is not a big editorial piece on why San Franciscans need food delivery. They want the largest, most comprehensive inventory of restaurants that will deliver food to them, preferably as quickly as possible. So what we learned early on was that different searches required different content optimizations that would appeal to the user. And we work with a lot of different websites, right? I'd say the most notable ones being DoorDash, Compass, All Trails in terms of their SEO footprint. And early on, you know, this was back in, I suppose, 2015, 2016, where this concept of content quality was not really a big idea back then. Right? If you've been in SEO for a long time, it's mostly been around backlinks and technical considerations. 
obviously targeting the right keyword was an important aspect of that, but that's about as far as people really thought in terms of the content being produced. So backtrack, there was this company that we worked with, not going to name what, who they are, but they thought it was a good idea to take a set of geographies. This is like a Yelp style website, right? So they served a lot of different cities and they take a set of geographies and then multiply it by all of the different services that one could offer in those geographies. As a result, you ended up with, I think at that time is 700,000 pages, except they took the same set of service providers and used them on all of the different pages. And you could imagine like a decade ago, this as a strategy would have made perfect sense. But we looked at that and we saw that Google basically put this website in the black hole, is that at least what we called it. And the way that we determined that was this concept of a crawl budget. And a crawl budget is if you have say 1000 pages on your website, the classical webmaster tools would tell you what percentage of those pages that Google would crawl every day. Right? And they'd be like, oh, on average, it's 800 of those pages. You could then say that you had a crawl budget of 80% because 800 of those pages would be crawled every day. In essence, this, this website had a 1.5% crawl budget. So out of the 700,000 pages that they were submitting to Google, Google would only crawl about like 10% or 1.5 or 10,000 of those, those pages. And we were like, you have a big content problem. Google does not like the fact that you're feeding it a bunch of junk pages and we need to go through and fix all of this stuff. And so, right, a lot of this work that we would do would involve contracting out freelance writers on Upwork and assigning them content assignments to flesh out pieces of content for, we call them like blurbs or copy blocks on so these pages. To take a step back really quickly. So it sounds like the, the main problem that they were trying to solve for, they were trying to rank for all these location specific queries and they tried to do it in an automated way. And what they, they missed was that certain queries, Google was expecting certain types of content. Is that correct? Yes, okay. that's correct. That's correct. And so, yeah, we, a lot of the consulting that we did just ended up saying to people, what is the true content experience that a user is going to care about given your particular search? And then how do we ensure that the content you're producing is likely to meet those standards? Because right, a lot of these websites were very authoritative sites and some pages would do really well and some pages wouldn't do really well. And right, you're studying then what Yelp is doing and what Zillow is doing and what all of these other really highbrow like directories are doing. And every single time, right, I still distinctly remember we were studying House and House is a directory website of like home service providers, but they also have like interior design and you know, all that cool stuff. And House made sure that every single start of their listings, you can imagine like interior designer in San Jose, had gorgeous photos. And then the moment you click next onto the second page of results, like oftentimes the, it, it just became really bad, <laughs> like in terms of a content experience. So we're like, our, oh, okay, let's like help people a, make their a content lot of, better. A lot of folks in our, in our community and, and that ask us questions ask this thing of like, how do I know what type of content piece to write for a particular query? So you're, you're kind of, in your story, you're, you're dancing around this, this question. I wonder if we can sort of just attack it directly. Uh, so for a given query, um, how do you know, right? So, so say know? we are trying to rank for, um, so you mentioned like a Yelpy type query, but maybe a more common one would be a SaaS type query, something like, I don't know, like uh, best accounting software for small business or something like that, right? So you could do a list post and list a bunch. So that, that this actually comes up all the time in our client work. So say, say a client is some accounting software 
and and we're trying to rank for best accounting software for small business or something like that, best accounting mm -hmm. software. So sometimes we debate ourselves, like, do we just list 30 people, including them? And sometimes the client's like, well, why would I list my competitors for that? Or do you do like a long piece that just says, here's why we think we're the best accounting software, or do we do a landing page, for example, just take those three hypotheticals. Or, or are there other types of blog posts that, that people should be writing? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, how so, do you do the calculation of what, what, what it wants? Yeah, I think classically speaking in a modern day search lens, the approach that we recommend because it's understandable is a bottoms up approach, right? And a bottoms up approach entails Googling best accounting software, inspecting the search engine results page and concluding that for the majority of the results that are ranking for best accounting software, that you're going to have comparison style content, right? People want to know, okay, how does accounting software A compare with accounting software B? All of that different stuff, right? So what um, we're looking at in the screen share right now, right? So you're, saying, so you're, you're saying sort of strategy number one or the basic strategy is see what is already ranking and then do that. Yes, exactly. And that is strategy number one. Now, one level deeper within that strategy, as especially when it deals with this best accounting software, is going to be brand distinction. So best accounting software, right? I haven't really taken a look at this, but if you Google best help desk software, you'll actually notice that I believe Zendesk or Freshdesk are going to show up for this particular search, not in the top top spots, but if you keep scrolling, um, the, do they show up? I guess they have an ad. We have paid, but oh, here, what about in searches related to? Right, Fresh so desk. you do see like Fresh Desk show up. Does their homepage show up like Fresh Desk for this particular search? Does Let's it not? see here. Uh, doesn't it look like it. Or it does not. All right. Yeah. So, right in this particular case, we just like rule this out. I think Zendesk and Freshdesk might end up showing up. Yeah, here. Yeah, Zendesk. On, this, on page two. Yeah. So sometimes we see that happen, but really at the end of the day, at a high level, what's happening is Google is measuring user engagement signal. And you can imagine that for best accounting software or best help desk software, Google just wants to give people a search engine results page that has the highest likelihood of concluding a search journey. So what that means is that when Zendesk was tested as say position three or position four, it was just strictly worse than what is currently the search engine results page, at least in the model that I'm using. And, so, and what, what is considered worse? Does that mean someone clicks into the page and then bounces or, or like, what are, what are some of those metrics that Google might be looking at to determine that? Yeah, so I would say if, like at a high level, you could think of bounce rate and average time on page as like lagging metrics in the sense that like generally if less people bounce on your page, you could assume that um, or leading, they're leading metrics. You can assume that they're finding more of what they needed on your page. But really, I think the ultimate metric is the concluding of the search journey in the sense that you don't go back to Google and click on another result, and you don't go back to Google and perform an additional search for some period of time, right? And Google knows this because we all have Gmail accounts or use G Suite or Google Chrome. Right, so they know, oh, okay, you know, Benji was logged in and he performed a search for best accounting software. And seven days later, he was on his phone and he then performed an additional search for best accounting software for small businesses. So Google is taking all of these data points and saying, okay, well, that happened on this search engine results page. Now, what would happen for a new set of users on a different set of search results page? And then they're like, oh, okay, Bernard performed the search for best accounting software. And when we presented him with this, he just clicked on a result and we didn't see him again. Or what he then did was Google Freshdesk and then we didn't see him again. So um, Google's going to look at that 
And it's all of that stuff. I have, I have such an interesting question for this now. Now, the comparison pieces, it's interesting that they come up on top. And now based on what you're saying there, is it because that if you're comparing, so if someone's searching for best help to sign the comparison piece for people. Listening. Sure. So a comparison piece is just a, a web page or a blog post that shares all of the different options in a specific category. So if we're best help desk software, if you were to click into this Capterra post, you would see just a bunch of different companies that offer help desk software. So now I'm wondering, are these comparison posts so good for these type of keywords because someone can find all of the different options in one piece and then click to the different places from within that blog post. So the person is not going back to the search engines result page to find new companies or new articles. That's absolutely correct. Interesting. So um, if, you, Interesting. if you don't mind, I would love to share with you. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I do this all the time. Like, in our I know I, I would love to have you share. Cause yes, yes. Uh, so right here, right. This is kind of the oh, thing. split screen. Yeah, you have to use incognito to, to do the not personalizations. So you can imagine applicant tracking system, right? This is software category, very competitive, very expensive. You'll see, right, this is then the common approach that we say that you should take for the um, this idea that Devesh was, was saying earlier is that to do effective keyword research these days, you just want to do search intent discovery, which in my opinion means Googling the, the target keyword and counting, counting the number of occurrences of each intent that you see. So you'll see here for the applicant tracking system that the top two results are going to be like topic clusters like this. So these, right topic clusters there. So if I can just pause you here, just to make it clear that everyone who's listening understands the, the, the underlying assumption that we're making here is search intent can be discovered by just looking at what Google's doing. Meaning we're saying Google tests a bunch of pieces in different spots and moves them up and down, measures this engagement signal. And when a search concludes, as you just said, and therefore it's already pretty well optimized page one, say, for search intent. So therefore, if it's heavy on a certain type of piece, it knows that that's what people want. And so you should pay attention to that, right? This is like- That's exactly underlying. it. Yes. Okay. So this is then like the bottoms up approach, right? So we see if you look at a topic cluster and just for clarity, for those who are not familiar with topic clusters, it's usually your like ultimate guide to X, X 101, what is X, everything you need to know about X or simply X. And they'll usually start with the high level concept of what is X like this. And you'll see another one right here, same stuff, actually same domain too, which is interesting. So two topic clusters rank as one and two, then you'll see here this top best shows up like this. So we'll say, okay, top best shows up. And then you'll see here top best shows up again. So then like that, and then you'll see here rank number three is Wikipedia. Wikipedia shows up right there. How we know Wikipedia answers what is, and this is part of step three, is that when you Google the target intent that you've identified, you should be able to get it back in Google search. So whenever I Google what is and whatever Wikipedia says, we'll pretty much always get the same Wikipedia result back like that, which is why we can say, okay, Wikipedia is like saying what is. So you'll see here, employer's use shows up right here. Then you have top best, top best two of those like this. And then you'll see here, this one's actually a topic cluster, how to write a resume to beat. If we looked at it, it's gonna have the, what is, how do they work, how to write an ATS resume. So it's another topic cluster, but they're specifically calling out the what is and how to write a resume to beat. So we'll say resume and beat like that. And then you'll see here, this is a solutions page in the sense that Bamboo uh, HR say we offer applicant tracking systems and here are features. So you can see here that a solutions page will work. So right now you can already see where I'm going with this, hopefully, is that Devesh was saying, okay, well, what are the top things that we could use to target this particular query? Well, you can see here, right, we're seeing four occurrences of 
these um, solutions page or these comparison pages work, but a solutions page could work or a topic cluster, right? We have three occurrences of that. Those could work as well. So you'll see here, right? What the topic cluster so, then- so, so hang on, why did you pick just the solutions page? Isn't it that any, any of these could work? You have two what is, you have one employer use, one resume, any of that could work. Right? Any, yes, any of this, any of this okay. could absolutely okay. work. It's is, just that- is, is there one you would lean towards more than another? And, and also within that question, so what's interesting is, is some people are taking the approach of just going after one of these uh, queries. So it's like someone's- Versus multiple of them. Yeah, what, so if someone's answering the what is question in a blog post thoroughly. Yeah, and then others are are saying we're going to take the approach of just doing top best as the entire blog post. But then there's also somewhat of a hybrid. You could do the top best, then you could answer the what is. You you could like mix a few of these different frameworks within a post. I, I'd love to just get your take on just which of those approaches is best. Is, is the topic cluster? if you're going to go through a couple of these, a good approach to take, or is it best to answer like a single type? I... Yes, yes. These are all actually interrelated questions yeah, yeah. in all of this. Let's first then talk about why a topic cluster is somewhat still relevant, but losing relevance to a certain degree. Um, so I kind of wish that we started with another example which we, we can move of, on to a different example. No, no. I mean, it, yeah, it's like usually it, it's like a good way to build on on this. Okay. Okay. So let's just take a look first at bone broth, so you can understand what is happening within search. If we do a search for bone broth, you'll notice that what we see ranking number one is how to make, right? Just in the title tag, and then the health line is going to say how to make and reasons why you should. You could assume that reasons why you should implies benefits. And then it's followed quickly by another benefits like that. And then generally too, right, when we're inspecting SERPs, we would want to pay attention to like the fact that there is a popular products that shows up like that, right? And then this fact that there is a local map that shows up. We call these, SEOs call these SERP features like that. So these imply different other intents that the user is likely to care about within the subject. You'll then see a videos carousel, video carousel like that. You'll then see images, image carousel like that. And then you'll see now how to make instant pot. So you'll see here, we'd go how to make, and then we go one level deeper within how to make because it's calling out the specific kitchen instruments, the instant pot, the crock pot, and the stove top like this. And then you'll see here, what is bone broth and then kettle and fire. So this is actually a product page. So you have then one for what is, you have one that's a home page or product page. So like product page like this. And then this is like New York Times saying like paleo drink like that. And then you have bone broth versus stock like this. You can see this is then the front page of what's currently ranking for bone broth. In the next step, what we always recommend is that you Google then the identified search intent like this, so bone broth benefits. If I were to Google this, you'll see, right, this medical news today is exactly the same medical news today there. And this health line, right, this is exactly the same health line here. And if we wait, were to go wait, to- for the pause, this is the strategy for how to confirm that your categorization is correct. Is correct. To just make a more specific search and make sure that the things you categorized under the benefit category in bone broth do show up when you Google bone broth benefits. Exactly. Can't okay. that also be indicated just by the questions people ask there? So if you were to search bone broth, you see the benefits as the number one question. So that would lead you to believe that. Th no, no, but what we're talking about is him categorizing okay. when he went through that health line was in the benefit bucket. Okay. Okay. And so to, to, if you Google that and see that that shows up there. Yes, right. So now we're confirming that the identification of search intent is correct. Yeah, the list is correct. Yeah. You right. And then you'll see here, right? It actually does follow this order, like, hopefully. <laughs> uh, let's see here. There's a lot of, okay. So shape, you see shape, and then you see Dr. Axe show up. So those get skipped right now, but you'll see shape and Dr. Axe right here. Generally, I think there is like, so Google's always updating their algorithm, but it generally follows this exact order. You can imagine then, should you be ranked number one or number two for bone broth benefits, that's actually then the correct subtopic or perspective 
that the user wants, we can infer, right, that what likely happened over time, and you'll see here if I click on this, and I do a space, is that you see recipe and benefits. So we always recommend that you take a look at Google Autocomplete Suggestions because Google Autocomplete Suggestions is Google's way of telling you as a searcher, if you wanted to perform a subsequent search, given this particular topic, you probably want to know how to make it <laughs> and reasons why you should like that, right? So you get actually a blended top two intent mm. from Healthline that is very like. So you have a target keyword then, and you want to know subtopics inside, just hit space and see what Google is telling you it, people want. Exactly. And then you'll see here, right? If we do recipe, you'll notice that, right? Nourish Kitchen, guess what? That's the one. That's what people want, right? Hopefully, guess what? That's the other one. And it <clears throat> is in the right order, right? <laughs> like you see here, rank number one for how to make or recipe is rank number one for bone broth. But then you have two that specifically talk about the benefits. And then rank number two for recipe becomes, right? All the way down here and you'll notice right this what does it say bone broth instant pot you'll see here what do you have as number four <laughs> it's instant pot like that right so google is literally saying okay so many people we've seen just simply google bone broth in the past and at that time they didn't find what they needed so what did they do they googled bone broth recipe and at that wow. time right they didn't find what they needed so then they googled say like beef bone broth beef bone broth recipe like this. And then you see this merging of this long tail subtopic with the head topic that you're going after. Yeah, so what you're saying on, on the, the head keyword of just bone broth is that for the search results page for that query, you're seeing a mix of different types of content that Google is suggesting that you might want to, to click into. But then as you get more specific, you're seeing just more specific articles that relate to that, that query. Totally, totally. So, right, this was then hopefully a demonstration to say that back to what you were asking earlier, what to, what to do you do? Yeah. I'm actually seeing this world where the Brian Dean skyscraper technique is not the way anymore. I was actually joking with an SEO earlier today. We're like, it's all about the ranch style SEO, right? <laughs> Where you have you have a, a pen for your pigs, you have a pen for your cows, you have a pen for your horses, and that's it, right? You're just saying, okay, you have a question, I have an answer. You have a question, yeah. I have an answer. And so how do we, the, the reason why this is so potent too is because you only have one, uh, you only have one title tag and you only have one above the fold experience. This is the critical reason why a ranch style of SEO approach is absolutely potent, right? Because somebody's saying, I want to know how to make bone broth with an instant pot. And you can say, I, I have it, how to make bone point. broth with an instant pot. But so somebody wanna... else, <laughs> oh, go ahead. But then, but, then, but then what guarantees you're gonna rank higher than these other people though? You know, like if everybody, if it's a simple query like that, and you have a recipe, they have a recipe, then, and, and you just, you just try it from a bone broth instant pot. Like what, I guess the skyscraper technique. I, I think what, so what I wanted to clarify in, in the difference in your two examples, you're, you're saying the skyscraper technique, the entire premise behind it was I need to create the most robust piece on this topic, answer a ton of different questions and uh, intents in this one blog post. And, and you're saying ranch style means no, that, that method might be going away. You should instead focus on very specific queries and just have very targeted answers to those specific queries. Is that, is that kind of what you're saying? Yes, that is exactly what I'm saying. And then I guess to Devesh's point, you need to be ranked number one for that particular very long tail question that somebody has. And this is why we're breaking these out so granularly. Uh -huh. Right, because we've identified that being rank number one for how to make bone broth is actually then what qualifies you to bone broth. So you can think of what we've just done here as giving you probability to ranking for this particular topic, applicant tracking system, yeah. right? With four occurrences that are showing up from top best, you can imagine, right, when I do this, 
what do you see over here, right? This select software review, that's one shot that you got right there. This Captera, this is another shot that you got right there. This mm -hmm. HR technologist, right? That was the other shot. And you can see here, uh, technology advice does not currently show up, but this PC Mac, I believe was the other uh, software. Advice. So so what, So what? another thing that that would imply is that you, so if you were to use the skyscraper technique, let's say to go after a head keyword, that that might work for, that, for might the work. Head, that, that might work for the head keyword. But what you're saying is, as people start uh, entering in more specific queries, let's say like the bone broth benefits and stuff like that, and your post was created to rank for that head keyword, if someone's writing better content to just the bone broth benefits question, then that person is more likely to rank in a top spot for that, that query. Yep, that's yeah. right. Because we've identified it as a core intent that the user or subtopic or perspective, if you will, that the user cares about within this particular topic. So that's why this as a bottoms up approach is very potent because what you're basically saying, right, is you're using Google, which we can infer has done a lot of machine learning to derive what the intent of the searcher should be. And then we are just simply reverse engineering that and saying, should we want to then have the highest probability of succeeding, then we should emulate what are the core problems or questions that people have given that particular topic and then strive to be the best in those particular perspectives. Okay, so various qualifiers so, or and, and, and definitions. This is just for readers to or listeners to get this and to make sure that I understand it correctly. <laughs> so what you're defining bottoms up, I can define as as break out a keyword into all these other like sub themes or questions, and then and then see the correlation of which of those sub themes and questions. Uh, are more likely to put you at the top of like your target keyword, what we're just calling in this conversation a head keyword. It doesn't need to strictly be a head keyword. And then, and that's the bottoms is like, you're, you're, you're taking a keyword and saying, here's all these little things and I'm gonna go after those first. And it's clear from Google search thing that I can look at, I can look at the results from all the sub ones and it's gonna be correlated. That's the bottom. Absolutely. Yep. And then, so then the obvious next question is, well, so then how do I rank number one for the bottom keyword? Like how to make beef bone broth with Instapot or something like that. Right. Well, then you do it again. Would, Is it like we nested? do it? We keep, yeah, we keep doing it again until we arrive at the like end, the end path that the user took. So um, before we, we continue with that, I do want to like talk about this, this concept of like this topic cluster and what you should do. Yeah, so you also said this is losing effectiveness and I'd love for you to touch on that too. Yeah, so it's losing effectiveness because generally speaking, people have like deeper questions around a particular topic and topic clusters usually just, it's like a brush stroke, a broad brush stroke. And I say, okay, well, I'll give you a little taste of what everything could be about this particular um, subject matter. So again, right, how topic clusters are normally like compiled is that you'll do all of the different angles that the user is going to care about, one to 10 paragraphs, then summarize what it is. And then you'll commonly see a link out to a read full article here, which implies the like spoke page or child page or whatever people call these like that, right? So it's gonna go, what are applicant tracking systems? First, I do wanna walk you through how I would approach building an applicant tracking or a topic cluster. So you'll see here, right? What are applicant tracking systems? We saw during search intent classification that there were two occurrences of what is an applicant tracking system show up. And so- Bernard, Can I pause you to just ask a definitional question? Sure. If, if there was the same post for like everything about applicant tracking systems as you're showing here on the right-hand side from job scan, but each of those sections it was not a link to us read the full article. It was just like putting all the info in there. Yeah. Do you still define that as a topic cluster or no? Topic cluster you're defining as like a meta post that links to all the little subtopics? Um, I, yeah, there's, that's the, the a good Once. clarifying question. People just loosely say hub page, pillar page, yeah. <laughs> topic cluster. I, 
I usually will lump together and everything you need to know that does not link to subpages as a hub page, pillar page, or topic cluster. However, just- Oh, you're, right. saying, you're saying even if it doesn't link, you're still gonna loosely define it as that? Yes, I'm okay. still gonna loosely define it as that. And it's definitely something that you don't want to continue. You, like you want to start linking them out. As you can see with the bone broth example, you're going to get to the top spots by being the winner of a sp specific sub intent, right? So the fact that, and this is back to the title tag and above the full experience, you only get one, right? And so the individual links out to the standalone subtopics, like what you see happening here when I click on this is specifically targeting that particular intent. And that is important because, right, we're thinking now more of this ranch style of SEO of single title tag, single question, single answer, single above the fold experience. Okay. Cool. So one, right, what are applicant tracking systems? You'll see here too, very common. And it's like why, pros and cons, that kind of stuff. We did see one occurrence though of employers use show up during search intent classification there. Um, become heading two. You'll see here heading three. As you say, they're everywhere, but it's actually a disguised section on the top applicant tracking systems like this, right? Most a bunch of competitors. And so three is going to be top best. Obviously, top best, right? Shows up quite a bit right there. Four is going to say how applicant tracking systems work. You'll see here, right? This is another thing that we do is we go, okay, what would happen if we like prepended these different like question modifiers like mm. this, right? It's like, oh, look, how applicant tracking systems work. That's a pretty important question that shows up right there. So we'll take that one. Let's see here, like five resume formatting matters. You'll see here, right? Resume did show up right there. I don't know if it shows up right here. It does not, but if I put an R and get the, the resume right there, but we just saw one occurrence of resume show up right there you can say, okay, heading five, heading six, how to beat applicant tracking systems. You'll see beating, right? That showed up right there as well. So you have now five is resume, six is beating, right? Seems fairly, fairly interesting what you see happening yeah. here, right? Seven so is going to say, don't post cheat. has all of the elements. Right. So you'll see here, right? When we look at the people also ask, what does it say? How do you pass or beat, right? What are the top, top best? How do you use, you know, why employers use or employers use? Like that shows up. And if you look at the related searches, top, how to be free, test your resume, resume. Ah, oh, these are where the resumes come from like that. And if you looked at the second page, guess what? It's gonna say best, how do they work? Uh, what is? Secrets to making, secrets to beating, how to beat, what so there's it is. There's all these indications from the people also asked from the related searches. And, and the title from, tags. Yeah, from the title tags of the SERP itself and from autocomplete. Yes. Google's telling you on all this, all the subtopics to talk about in the post. Exactly. So but you you're also imagine, saying right? that, that this type of post is becoming less effective. So I, I want to ask you why. So it, it so... Theoretically, if, if someone's answering all these things within one post that someone, yeah, I, I don't get why this would be less effective going forward. Yeah, so we I've been looking at applicant tracking system for a while, but you can sure. imagine that this happens. Like when I first looked at applicant tracking system, it was a fairly nascent concept because the applicant tracking systems didn't exist before. So as a result, you actually got a lot more informational content that showed up for applicant tracking system. Now you can imagine, right, this topic cluster, it covers all of the different probable perspectives that the user is going to care about within this piece. Let's pretend for a second, this is a very common scenario. You don't talk about your competitors, right? Yeah. You don't include yeah. your top best. Yeah. So what is the user going to do after consuming a piece of content? A non go and look for products <laughs> are going to go back yeah. and say, I want one now, which one are the best ones? Right? So, you're, so you're saying, just to clarify really quickly, so you're saying the main problem with this blog post is that from your perspective, the main intent of a searcher here is to find a product. And so this blog post that we're just analyzing is more informational in nature. It kind of covers all of the things around this category, but the actual intent of a searcher is to find 
a product that they can use that is an applicant tracking system? It's the it's going to be the eventual evolution of the topic, right? Your, the thing that you said, the end goal of the searcher is yes. to find this product. Right. So you can imagine when I Google help desk software, I don't get anybody asking what it is and why I need it. This is accepted <laughs> that you need a help desk software. You will don't need to know what it is and why they need it and how to use it. Do you think the it. difference in those two queries is that an applicant tracking system is somewhat more complex of a software to understand. So it's feeding more informational blog posts to try to cover that those bases, whereas help desk software is very straightforward and people are just looking for a solution. I think it's the combination of what you were saying and also the maturity of the space, right? Like applicant tracking systems are fairly novel as a concept and help desk mm -hmm. software has been around for a long time. This is why yeah, there is that. nothing at all surrounding what it is. But you could imagine, right, when they first came out, people would be like, well, what is it? Why do I need a help desk software, right? So I think it's the combination of, of both. But in my perspective, I would actually lean it more towards the maturity of the topic, really just in the sense that people know what it is. So that then is a natural segue, right, into, I was, I've been saying bottoms up, bottoms up. But that's a natural segue into then this idea of top down. So what is this idea of top down? In a very simplistic way, top down SEO, in my opinion, is that you have such extreme domain expertise that you can predict mm. the future. <laughs> sure, so I was just looking at- I know better than Google what the intent is here. I know better than Google what the intent will be from here, right? Uh, so um, I was looking at mortgage forbearance with a customer of ours. And you can see here, right, a lot of the stuff, this is around like COVID. It's like, oh, what you, know, what you should know, what it is, what you should know. But you'll see here, oh, look, a top stories block is like showing up. Generally, when you see a top stories block, again, we're just reading SERPs <laughs> all the time it implies that this is a topic that is changing very rapidly, right? You'll see the positioning of the top stories block is indicative then of how fast mm -hmm. the topic is evolving. If it's number one, this thing is changing like every hour, right? For best credit cards, you'll notice that everyone's very aggressive, like November, November, 2020. And you'll see that, okay, there's currently not a top stories block. So a lot of times there, there will be, but the presence of one, um, means that it's it's usually a topic that's changing really quickly and you can see here what to do when the cares act mortgage forbearance ends what you know and the impact of it it's that this thing is ending soon i think it ends like september october november i don't know but, I think 31st. right yeah yeah exactly so before entering mortgage forbearance right so this is basically uh, a nod towards this evolution of a topic and right if you are able to know, obviously this one makes, this is like legal, but if you're able to say, oh, I think that this is going to like happen at this point, you can craft the perspective piece before people craft the perspective piece and therefore have the correct intent and be, you know, in the top spots for. That. So this is where, it, so like news and current events play into this in some way is what you're saying. So like, for example, some mortgage company knew that this deadline was coming and they wrote a post about that anticipating people are going to be searching for when does the deadline hit and some rules around it. You're saying, okay, so that's where you're saying this would play into what yeah, you're this, right Is here. there any examples of this in, in not in like a newsy way? So like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, this then you can imagine, this is like the example that I usually use. It's like start a gym like this. And you'll see, okay, eight essentials le uh, lessons that experts taught us about opening a gym. So this is what I usually call the, and this is now like the deepest of the iceberg, at least as far as I've understood uh, SEO, uh, is content strategy. So content strategy then it is multi-dimensional, right? And this as an idea would be wrapped around this concept that I've been calling stages of like awareness like this. So you can imagine for stages of awareness, how to do X like that. 
somebody wants to know how to do blah. But you could imagine that before doing blah is things to consider before doing blah, right? Or X or expert lessons, expert lessons, common mistakes. This is going to be the first stage of awareness. The second stage of awareness is going to actually be how to do X, maybe how much it costs to do X and things surrounding like doing it, right? Steps, that kind of thing. The third thing is why you should not do X or X is like dead, something like that. So you'll notice, right? This is eight essential lessons experts taught us about opening a gym, right? Things to consider, how to do it, how to do it before opening a gym. Ask yourself these seven questions. If you looked at this from a pure monthly search volume perspective, there is absolutely no search volume for before opening a gym. Ask yourself these seven questions or even things to consider before doing X. You'll see here, right, this video block, three mistakes to avoid when opening a gym, then how to do it, how to do it, how to do it. Google has some disambiguation here. It's like, oh, maybe you want to start working out, start a gym workout. <laughs> so we'll provide that with you there. And then on the second page, you'll see, right, three mistakes, that one shows up. And then six reasons why you should never open a gym. So you can imagine, right, this has gone through then the different perspectives that a user could care about given this particular topic. And even though, right, there's no particular search volume associated with one and three, Google is still saying that when I place those in the search results, they do a good job. And so, right, this is a perspective that a user could want. So mm -hmm. different queries are going to then have different content strategies that are going to work. Like this is another interesting one is Soylent. But you'll see here rank number oh, two is Twitter, but rank number three is The Verge. And what does The Verge say? It says, Soylent Survivor, one month living on lab-made liquid. So this is what I call perspective, right? And you could imagine that perspective highly deals with consumer packaged goods or experiences, right? Soylent, of course, is the meal replacement. You can see like that playing eating. out in like medical, anything medical related to you. I had right. this experience, yeah. Exactly. So it's like, I tried this and here's what happened. And yeah. here's what happened. And that makes sense, right? Because people want to know what happened. I stopped eating for, I got drunk, right? And on the second page, you're going to see a bunch of this stuff, right? Stopped eating three years. Here's how, do they work? Are they safe? What happened when I went 30 days? I've eaten a meal replacement for twice a day. So I tried this and here's what happened. What the user is going to care about is why you and evaluation criteria. That's it, right? So why are you the expert? in this particular experience, right? I work with this doctor, he's super renowned. Okay, then what did you do to evaluate this particular experience? Well, I had my blood sugar tested every day for the like last 30 days and here's how it influenced my, you know, keto or whatever, right? And so this, <laughs> this is like the craziest like part of SEO. And these are just like frameworks that you can think about to like basically be a proxy for not being a subject matter expert. But you can imagine that as a subject matter expert, right? I could take this like idea where I'm like, okay, a keyword research is dead. Here's how to do it instead, right? And I, I really do strongly believe that if I were to really spend a lot of time creating this piece of content that I could see it rank for how to do keyword research yeah, or I even keyword research, right? Because, right, keyword research is dead. <laughs> like just based on what we're looking at right now, right? Yeah. It's this different idea of being a extreme subject matter expert, understanding the range of perspectives that a user could care about within a topic that you're writing about. And then obviously prioritizing the ones that are going to have the highest possibility of yeah. working. Wow, this has been amazing. I, I have like a number of questions that I want to ask you unrelated to some of this stuff. But I think this entire walkthrough is, is super helpful for someone just trying to figure out what to write and how to rank for specific keywords. We can do uh, a rapid fire segment. Yeah, yeah. So 
We have this question from someone on our team, but it actually plays into something that Davis and I have been talking a lot about, but how do you see content playing a bigger role than links in the future? Or do you, do you see some of the stuff that we're talking about being more influential and in getting stuff to rank than just pure backlinks? Oh, absolutely. We're already seeing that happen across the board. So um, this concept is multi-layered, right? We were talking, okay, some of your clients just want to create the best accounting software post without really talking about the entirety of the topic. So in my opinion, there's three, three fundamental aspects to influence your initial ranking in the Google search results, followed by a user engagement experimentation testing to make sure that you deserve that ranking in your content's ability to complete the search journey. So number one is going to be just your classical sense of backlinks from a relevance perspective. Right, so Google's going to want to know if you're talking about accounting software that you're getting links from people who are authoritative about accounting. Number two is going to be your topical authority. So Google's going to say, okay, well, if you have written about anything surrounding accounting software, then how well is that set of content doing in Google search? The last one is going to be a micro level of like subject matter coverage, which is where ClearScope comes into hand. So you can imagine, right? You can publish an extraordinary great piece of content that covers the subject matter comprehensively using a content optimization tool. And Google's gonna say, okay, well, if you don't have backlinks and you've never talked about this as a topic, I'm not that confident that you're gonna do a good job. So we're seeing the influence of your topical authority and just your subject matter piece of content that you've written override backlinks yeah. over so, time. So you're saying also, so that that makes me think that the more you write on a specific topic, so even, even if you start off with a low domain authority, let's say you start off with like a domain rating of 10 or 20, and you're starting to write about the same subject. So imagine we were starting to write for Grow and Convert we start putting out five or 10 or 15 different posts on different aspects of content marketing. Even with a low domain rating and, and a low amount of backlinks, you're saying over time, just blogging about that topic continuously should help you rank for that category. Absolutely. That's it. And we have lots of cases where people like ping me and like, don't tell anybody, but I built zero backlinks and I'm crushing it. Yeah. We, I mean, yeah, we've yeah. seen, you've but, seen but, the same thing. That one, two, three by you was ranked. That it should be, it, it's like in order of what you're guessing the uh, Google's algorithm is doing it. Number one is the classical number of backlinks or whatever, quality of backlinks. Number two, topical authority. Number three, the coverage of the subject matter properly, i.e. what ClearScope software helps do. Yeah, I would probably say that that's the case. Although I think topical authority and backlinks are actually kind of like Together. becoming more even. Yeah. And, and, and that's and, what and we're the saying. observation is that you're starting to see more and more that the two and three topical authority and then the way you're covering the subject matter, i.e. what we discussed for 40 or 50 minutes just now, that the combination of those two can push you above the back. Yeah, thing. absolutely. And I mean, we're, we're seeing mind, the same right? thing. Yeah. yeah, so we're seeing that like a lot of clients ask us or even prospective clients and calls ask us like, well, how many links do you build? How many links? And, and Benji always responds or we always respond like, we're seeing that we don't need this huge volume of links. Like we, we're using ClearScope, we're covering it. We use subject matter experts to like inform the content. And then like one, two links just boost it up. After. Right. Yeah, it, exactly. it helps the speed at which things rank. Uh -huh, but it's, yes. It's not, but, it's, but it's not 10, 15 links, right? Not 30, 50 links. Yes. But, but, but I, think, I think a lot of people's misconception is that they can just write whatever on a topic and then they just build 15, 20 backlinks. And that's what's going to indicate to Google yeah. that this is a valuable piece of content. And yeah. I think that is the, the major misconception because what we're, what we're saying is like, Let's take cognitive, one of our clients, for example, we started writing a ton about different aspects of concussions and concussion treatment. And even with our low domain authority, I think we started with them at, they were like 21. We started to see them outrank WebMD and Healthline and all these major players because we're writing way more specific content 
in, in yeah. the concussion space. So and their even entire with, domain is just about concussions, not everything about health. Yeah, and so right. we're seeing the same thing. It's, it's yeah. not about link of volume as no. much as it is about writing very specific answers to queries in, in a category. That's it. Yeah, that's it. So yeah, let's just say I think the three of them get your initial like seating and then you play on user engagement, right? So yes, this is all like in my framework. It all makes sense. When you build backlinks, you expedite Google's trust. Yeah, that's yeah. the content that you produce should be taken a serious experimentation look at. But then when you're in the front page, I usually say, you're no longer playing on links or mm -hmm. probably like subject matter, like authority. You're playing mm -hmm. on a different field, right? You're playing on yeah. your content's ability to conclude the search journey. And for certain categories of searches, mm -hmm. what that means is just your brand and yeah. PR, right? Mm -hmm. The like nerd wallet gets number one for best credit cards. It's, un it's like one could just say that maybe they just have a higher click through rate right? because people are like, oh yeah, I trust Nerd Wallet. And that itself is a like, you know, SEO flywheel that they have been able to like build. And so when people come in and they're like, Bernard, I want to rank for backpacks, something really high <laughs> level. What I say is like, that's, that's a brand problem, right? Like people don't know you to be selling backpacks and you need to be able to create enough influence. Yeah. And this is an SEO speak known as a navigational search. So you have to influence enough people in Google who are typing in backpacks who don't see your brand to go back to Google and type backpacks plus your brand. And then you're training Google to say that your brand should show up for backpacks. And that's how you run That's fascinating. Backpacks. I have a couple more very specific questions. So one of the questions that we often get asked just by clients or even by people on our team. So after you publish a page or a blog post on your site, what is that testing window? Like how, how long does that typically take for Google to figure out this is where your, your page belongs? And I know it's, it's an ongoing process, but yeah. just that initial testing that happens. I'm curious about that. Yeah, I mean, it really does hinge upon those three aspects to a significant degree. This is why Google SEO, when you're getting started from nothing, takes a really long time is because Google is going to start you off at the ninth page or, you know, position 90 or 120 or something like that. And OK, you know, how many legitimate users actually make it to the ninth page of Google? Very, very few. So you're going to get a very low sampling, right, of like confidence over time, right? Google will probably keep trying to bubble you up, assuming that you're, you know, hitting like your content has hit the right points. But that's where, right, a backlink or two really then goes, oh, okay, position, you know, 35. And then, mm -hmm. right, you could imagine that the overall like impression count that you're going to get from legitimate users hitting the third page is going to be exponentially more, right? So that's why that expedite, like expedite, uh, the like quickness of building some backlinks is going to help is because um, you're boosting. It just tells it's relevant, basically. Right. Do you think like Google here. uses any other signals? So like one thing that we've always had a, a, a question or a hypothesis about is that we run paid traffic to some of the articles right after publishing, even though it's going after a keyword, mainly just to try to get, well, one, to build traffic and to try to get conversions that way. But also just the thinking is like, maybe Google's taking signals of time on site for, for this article as well. Do, do, you, do you think that that plays <laughs> into it at all? Like, I know, I know you're saying most of the time they're testing clicks from Google and that's their main way to, to see relevancy. But yeah, do but you think you just another way, other ways of traffic are signaling analytics on the site? <laughs> yeah, just signal to Google that this page might be valuable, like especially if people are staying on this page and reading it for like four to six minutes or something like that. Um, Google has publicly explicitly come out and said Google ads and Google search do not at all directly influence each other, which I believe to be true. I also think that you know the installation of Google Analytics and all of that stuff 
it would be a huge invasion of privacy, like if those were being used as direct like feeds into Google SEO. I do think that from in, it's all anonymized and it's all used as benchmarks at a very granular like way. So Google Analytics, you can imagine, right, powers the analytics of a bajillion different websites. But Google's, right, when you like are setting up your Google Analytics, you're gonna say, oh, are you in automotive? Are you in, you know, internet software, right? So they're using that as anonymized data to establish benchmarks of how content in certain industries should perform. And so that's then what I think is used. So you don't think they're just straight up measuring your traffic on Google Analytics and saying, well, this seems to be good. Let's rank them higher on Google search. Yeah, no, I don't think that that's directly happening. Got I it. think so it's all indirect. The process that they're backlinking is still the best way to just show relevancy to an article early on. So like if you're starting from scratch, let's say, aside from scratch, you're starting a blog about this category, you're saying just the best way to speed up results there beyond just continuing to publish in that category is just relevant backlinks to the site. Yeah, I guess there's also this like gray black hat approach of just getting legitimate people in the United States to Google the keyword, navigate <laughs> to your piece of content. Like, oh, is that the whole Neil Patel uh, Instagram thing that he, he tried like a few years ago? Oh, I, I'm it, not sure. It, he, he had like some models. Some, say who is, yeah, right? some mod models say who is Neil Patel. And I, he tried to get it to blow up. And I think it was just to get people to type in who is Neil Patel. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that actually works. I think it's just that a lot of people don't have like legitimate Google accounts, IP based in the United States that simulate legitimate user behavior. But we have run a test at one of the companies we were consulting for in the past where we had everybody do that, but we were all on one IP and it boosted it. And then Google actually like caught it and then just like dropped it, dropped it from the search results. Yeah, I've seen uh, years ago, I think Rand Fishkin asked everyone on Twitter in this one particular period, can you all Google this or anyone who sees this? And, yeah. and he screenshotted right then what the SERP looked like. And he said, can you Google and click on this link, this yeah. result? And then there's like in that Twitter history right afterwards, minutes later, you saw it move up. So a bunch yeah. of people just that follow Rand did it. Um, you, you, said, you said something really quickly that on page one, you think it moves to user engagement. Does that mean you think we, we should or anyone should be maybe devaluing building additional links? Because that happens all the time in our work for our clients is we'll make it onto like somewhere in page one and then it stalls. It's just really competitive there. And then we think like, we, we keep building links to it. But you're saying there, it sounds like from your answer, maybe where we should be investing our time and resources and mental energy is thinking back through your framework of what are all the subtopics that the user is looking at? Are we properly addressing them because of user engagement? And, and are we ending the search and how could we end the search? Better, uh, faster, exactly, yeah. yeah and you I, think that you know, it's more important than building links once you're on page one or possibly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think it is. I think it's either PR or it's making an even more engaging and relevant experience for the user, right? PR, PR for so that people start Googling that term and your and the brand or whatever. Exactly. Yes, exactly. So that was kind of this like other thing about best accounting software that is that sometimes you just become known as the best accounting software. Yeah. And that's when you show up for best accounting software because <laughs> somebody Googles best accounting software and then Googles Zendesk or Freshdesk. So and because oh, that and Google happening. can put together multiple yeah. searches from the same person. And, and yes, that's, exactly. Oh, that's I... why you saw in the related searches that Benji was showing earlier, Freshdesk was there. Yeah. And that's why we had seen, at least at some point, Freshdesk and Zendesk both ranking for best help desk software because it was just a very consecutively searched thing. And then oh, Google's- Benji, maybe this is the real reason why the paid social seems to anecdotally for us help. Yeah, because people, would, people, people would see it. this and then go and Google. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it just ties it back to the Dave Gerhard interview about just being out there and getting the brand name out there. Because if you yeah. get a ton of people searching for the brand name in this category, 
it just helps lift everything. Exactly. Uh, in SEO speak, I guess people call it a navigational search. And that trains Google to say, oh, well, when you searched help desk software and that didn't show up, they had to perform an additional search and then click and get what they wanted. So Google is going to start merging the, the click stream journey together. And that's how you really get the, the really high, like, you know, like backpacks or accounting software style stuff is that Google has to basically link your brand to that category. Well, thank you so much for your time. We'll end it there, but I, I think we could probably talk to you all day about this stuff. So, so yeah, maybe we'll have to schedule a follow-up to... call. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much, Bernard.